Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 4 of BMT 100, Introduction to Tourism and Hospitality Management. This week, we will be uh, covering two lessons from the, uh, from the textbook. The first one is the lesson for restaurants, and the second is beverages in the textbook. This week, uh, you will be again required to post your original uh, discussion topic into the, the forum, the discussion forum, and then reply to at least two others. And I would ask you to do this early in the week if you can to get started early in the week. Um, so it would be based on the readings as well as the lecture. Um, and then there is a quiz this week. I will, I promise, be covering in this lecture the questions from the quiz. Uh, it's also in your reading, but I will make sure that you have the information you need for the quiz. Uh, there are five questions on the quiz. You can do it any time um, before the, the end of the week, and it is t a total of 20 possible points. So let's get started. Food service and beverage service. Uh, in the restaurant, uh, lesson for restaurants, the, the objectives here are to categorize restaurants based on their respective qualities into the major segments. We're going to talk about, and you're going to read about understanding the styles of restaurant service and differentiating components of each. We're going to explain the roles and duties of front of house and back of house. Uh, so FOH, BOH, front of house and back of house management and employees. We'll be talking at a high level about how to calculate some of the basic numbers involved in analyzing restaurant operations. Um, you are going to have the opportunity in the text to do a much more in-depth um, exercise around this and more re reading as well as uh, there's some great external links that you can use to help understand those but we'll talk about it in our lecture and then we're also going to talk about some current issues and trends influencing the industry so let's go ahead and get started the various segments within the restaurant industry include QSRs which are quick service restaurants and these are the restaurants where you are going to be standing in line to place your order, you're going to be waiting. Um, you're going to pick up your own food from that uh, same counter, perhaps, and carry it back to your table. And then at the end of the meal, you're going to be bussing your own uh, table, most likely. These are the McDonald's, uh, Burger King, etc. Quick service. Uh, so those are very limited in terms of what service is provided by the staff. The staff certainly maintains the cleanliness of the operation. They're there to provide you a level of service at the counter, and certainly they have of the other segments. Fast casual. Um, these are restaurants where perhaps you do uh, wait in line to get your food, but maybe they bring it to you. It has some of the components of the quick service, but more likely it's, uh, you know, you may seat yourself and uh, the waitress or waiter comes to you and, and serves you, uh, there isn't some of the same formalities as there are in full service. In a full service restaurant, you usually come to the hostess or hostess, host stand and are seated, um, given menus, you're given some time to look at the menus, the, the wait staff waits on you, etc. cetera. Um, an extension of the full service is, of course, fine dining. Fine dining elevates the, the whole experience, and it takes the ambiance of the restaurant into consideration. The menu, um, typically in a fine dining restaurant, the fine cuisine that is served is paired with fine wines, and uh, there is much more attention to the detail than even in the full service. So different restaurant segments, of course, are characteristics of restaurants include ethnic restaurants. We have our Mexican, Chinese, Thai, uh, Vietnamese, all of the various ethnic restaurant offerings that are available to us um, around the world. Um, and then we also have themed restaurants, which are uh, certainly, um, some are geared towards a younger crowd, but there are, there are themed restaurants, um, certainly Long John Silver and, and the various restaurants that, uh, that aren't only geared towards children that are themed are available. So when we talk about restaurant management, we need to understand key metrics. Um, these are reports that would be looked at on, at the end of each shift, as an example. So the morning shift, as they cash out, uh, they would be looking at some of these metrics. 
Um, these are done by shift, daily, weekly, um, monthly, quarterly, annually. It gets rolled up into profit and loss statements, and it's really how the restaurant is uh, judged at the end of the, the, the period, whether it be the end of the day, the end of the week, or the end of the year. Um, and these include such things as food cost percentage. Food cost percentage is a, uh, a, a me metrics that is constantly looked at in terms of how high is the food cost percentage as a component of your overall uh, expenses. And what are the items that you can control? Your food cost is an item that you can control. You may find that you have um, you know, an item on your menu and maybe you can source that from a different save some money, which is going to help improve your food cost. So it is controllable. I have pricing surveys is another metric is how are you priced compared to your competition? So you would be looking at what your, your competition is pricing their items at. What are they serving? Um, you know, what do they have uh, available to their customers that you might want to include on your menus? Labor cost percentage. Uh, like food, labor is something that you have control over to the most, uh, to the most part. Uh, you certainly have to maintain a specific level of service. You are constantly needing to uh, look at that level of service that's being provided and understand is there a need to increase your labor based on your level of service provided. Um, this is going to vary by your uh, segment. Um, but you have the ability to the extent that you can within those parameters as a manager to manage your labor costs and to ensure that you're not incurring too much overtime, uh, ensure that you are you know, certainly um, considering the, the various um, questions of staffing levels, um, how much staff will you need on a Saturday night versus a Tuesday night as an example, um, all of those things to help you maintain your labor cost percentages. Contribution margin. So that shows, um, you know, what are your, what items are helping you to profit the most? Um, and what are those things that are um, helping to drive that profit? You know, the contribution to your, to your margin is what you really get judged on when you go to the bank. It's profiting um, in your business. Product specs speaks to the fact that we are, uh, in many cases, um, you know, we have very specific products that we need to serve as part of our either corporate or our uh, chef's expectations. Uh, you know, the, the product specs, um, understanding and ensuring that you have the correct product specs. So it's the right size item. It has the right uh, the right quantity and quality uh, for you to be able to serve in your restaurant. And then service expectation is another huge metric. So we've talked about this somewhat in previous lectures, um, but guest satisfaction is something that uh, restaurants are constantly needing to measure um, and, and understand what is it that we could be doing differently to make our guests happier. So when we talk about restaurant management, it really gets divided into the front of the house and then the back of the house. In the front of the house, uh, you have the things such as, as is mentioned in the text, physical attributes, the parking lot, the lighting as you enter the restaurant, the general ambiance, physical attributes that would include scents. Does the restaurant smell good? That's a quick and easy question to ask yourself. Does it look good? What is the, the uh, level of music? when you walk in. These are things that as a front of house manager, you have to be asking yourself from a guest's perspective, what is the guest seeing? When they walk into my restaurant, how do they feel into the restaurant based on these physical attributes? And physical attributes uh, would include such things as a piece of trash on the floor. Or if a, a restroom, if a toilet's out of order and there's a handwritten sign on this, the door to the stall, uh, you know, those are physical attributes that, that send a powerful message to your customers. And so obviously you'd want to have somebody to pick up that piece of trash uh, to, to make sure that that sign is, obviously make sure that the, that the toilet is being serviced, that's the case, but if it is out of service, 
uh, that there's a more professional sign than just a handwritten note uh, taped to the door. So those are some of the physical attributes that a front of house manager needs to be aware of. Um, certainly with the associates, uh, the front of house manager needs to be looking at those same things. What are the associates? How are the associates presenting themselves? Are they ready for the shift? Do they have the correct uniform on? Are they wearing their name tags? Do they have their stations? If they're a service staff and they're going to be waiting tables that evening, have they, they set up stations, meaning uh, the places where they have all of their supplies and their cups and their plates and their silverware, have they, uh, are those presentable? Guests do see those things. And so those are physical attributes that the associate controls. Another front of house um, area for focus is on the menu itself. And, you know, when you have a menu, uh, there's more to the menu than just the items that are listed on the menu. It's the look of the menu, it's the font, it's the, the, uh, the appealing look of the menu in general, but it's also the physical things that happen to menus over time. Um, you don't want to have a menu in circulation that has a torn edge or is sticky or has crayon markings from the last uh, patron's children. Um, these are things that as front of the house managers, uh, you're not only looking at the menu items that you're putting out, but you're looking at the physical appeal of the menu itself. Uh, front of house management is responsible for running profitability analysis. And this is on the previous slide, as I mentioned, something that you would be looking at. Um, what are the, on a daily basis uh, or on a shift basis, honestly, uh, at the end of your breakfast shift, what were your menu item sales? How did that, how does that relate to your uh, average sales for the week? Uh, what are some of the high cost items that were selling well um, or some of the high cost items that weren't selling. Uh, all of these things obviously look at, uh, look to help you to understand your profitability. And as a front of house manager, you're constantly needing to manage that profitability. Now in the back of the house, it's very similar in a lot of ways with the physical attributes. You have your associates, you have your workstations, their workstations, uh, you have the general upkeep of the back of house is just, in my opinion, it just as important as the front of house physical attributes. And so that is, uh, is the workspace organized? Is it clean? Is it organized to the point it looks appealing? And if a customer were to uh, come into the kitchen, would they feel that the uh, service staff was as well organized as they should be. Um, these are things that the back of house manager needs to be managing, managing and looking at. And when you talk about culinary associates, oftentimes there are, uh, there is the brigade system. The brigade system is, uh, was originally developed by Escoffier and, and it is probably a hundred years old, but it's the regimented division of duties in the kitchen. And that is part of the, uh, the tradition of the back of house is this hierarchy of chefs and how their uh, their jobs are um, delineated based on the tasks that they do, their responsibility, and their um, and their span of influence. So you have the chef de cuisine. Uh, you would have the sous chef. You might have a saucier. Uh, you know, you have your station cooks. You have various uh, levels of hierarchy within the as culinary associates. And this is described as the brigade system. Food safety procedures are critical to the success of your operation. Um, when you have a food safety scare, you can, your restaurant could be closed down. Uh, there is, uh, in Washington state, both front of house and back of house associates need, need to have food handlers cards in order to be able to work in food service. Um, but this certification requirement varies from state and by uh, from state to state and by city. Uh, so it is something that you need to be aware of uh, what the, the local laws are in your area. And then in the back of the house, another area in addition to um, or in conjunction with the front of house management, is the menu development and pricing strategy. 
uh, you know, based on what the theme of your restaurant is and the, the decor and the, the menu items, um, you know, how are you going to develop your menus to reflect that, uh, that and to be priced accordingly? So these are things that the house manager would be responsible for. Um, before we move into lesson six, I wanted to go back, and this is in your reading, but just to make sure that you're thinking about this when you are doing your quiz. Um, some of the trends in restaurant include sustainability in, in food procurement. We talked about this last week uh, in the lecture. And so sustainable food sourcing. Another trend is social media marketing. Just as we talked about last week uh, is restaurants are really focused on the use of social media and the use of technology in general to increase efficiencies. And one last item to mention is, um, it's in the reading, the restaurant's average check. Uh, you will want to understand what goes into the average check and what does that term mean? Um, is, you know, what is the definition of the average check? Hint, hint for the quiz. So lesson six, beverages. We're going to talk about uh, how categorize, how beverage operations are uh, categorized within the hospitality industry. In the reading, you'll understand the style of beverage service and differentiating components of each. Uh, we will also talk about the roles and duties of management in the practice of safe alcohol service employees. And this is something we'll spend some time on in the lecture here. Uh, and then we'll talk about how uh, you'll read a lot about how to calculate the basic numbers involved in analyzing beverage operation. I do want you to know there is some a, a great exercise there to help you understand how to calculate those basic numbers. And then we'll talk about some of the current issues and trends in the industry. So moving into beverage operation, we start with wine. Wine uh, is a is a drink that has been around for centuries for thousands of years, more than centuries. And it has uh, traditionally always been offered at a variety of, of styles, price points, um, these range of offerings. Uh, you have everything from high-end um, white wines and then down the spectrum to uh, some of the lower-end wines and, and items that you might, um, you might serve in a restaurant. And so there is a, a huge volume of knowledge related to wine service. And I can't begin to get into the details of it except to say that future classes have a lot more information on wine service. And, and you know, wines are served by the sommelier in fine dining restaurants. And to be a certified sommelier requires years of study um, to be able to describe the wine not only by tasting it, but by smelling it and by the looking at it. So these are things that, uh, you know, really add uh, a, a level to the beverage operation that, uh, that you can charge a premium for, that a knowledgeable wine steward really can drive your, your prices and your margins because of their knowledge. Now, when you talk about wine, you have to understand storage, display, and serving. So just briefly on each of those storage wine storage is critical um, wine is a living thing and if it is stored incorrectly it will spoil um, it will age if it's stored correctly um, some wines age better than others all wines age to some extent um, but certain wines are are by their nature more apt to age appropriately if they're maintained in the way that they need to be um, when you see a wine bottle lying on its side, that is specifically so that the, the, the wine in the bottle can come in contact with the cork and can keep the cork from drying out. Uh, a wine stored upright, uh, that wine doesn't have, the, uh, doesn't have that contact with the cork and it can dry out, crumble, and ruin the wine. Sometimes you'll hear the term corked wines, and that is sort of a misnomer. Um, cork wines doesn't necessarily mean that it tastes bad because the cork has been gone bad is the term that's used. A another storage tip with wine is wine hates fluctuations in temperature. 
So if you have a wine rack in a back of house part of your restaurant that gets direct sun in the middle of the day and the temperature goes up 10 degrees and then at night it gets cool and it drops by another 10 degrees. So there's this 20 degree fluctuation. You'll very quickly spoil the wine. Um, it's maintaining the wine at a constant temperature and, uh, and that's an important consideration. Red wine is typically served at a little bit cooler than room temperature. It uh, depends on the style, but a uh, little bit not cold, but uh, usually not warm either. Um, white wines are typically, again, everything is typical in this, is typically stored, uh, served at a, a cooler temperature. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you have to store white wine at a, in the refrigerator and red wine on the shelf. Um, as long as that temperature is consistent, uh, there are particular temperature ranges that it should be kept at that will help to keep it and maintain the quality of the wine. Displaying wine, uh, wine is often displayed in restaurants, in racks, um, in large bottles on the tables, things that will help to display and increase your sales. Uh, so displaying wine is important. And then serving. There is a ritual to serving wine, and I'll just talk through it uh, so you can imagine this if you haven't seen it yourself. When you order a, a bottle of wine off of the menu in many restaurants, and certainly in a fine dining restaurant, you would order by the bottle that you're ordering would be by the bin number. That bin number is important because they may have three or four bottles of the same type of wine but different years. So bin number is important to help that server understand exactly what wine you're ordering. When they go to the back, they come out with the wine. They should present that wine to you upright so that you're able to view the label and confirm that it is the same wine that you purchased, that it's not a different year, it's the same make, it's everything that you asked for. Um, so once you've had a chance to look at the menu, visually inspect it, the server would uh, the, would open up the wine with a corkscrew um, or open up the wine. Once they have wiped the top, cut the foil, removed the cork, they would remove the cork from the corkscrew itself. And then the presentation of that cork to the person who's buying the wine is an important ritual that shows the, the buyer that that wine has been aged correctly or has been stored correctly. Because if it hasn't been the wine, uh, if the wine hasn't been stored correctly, the cork will frequently either be dry or it might be uh, show signs of mold, et cetera, that would reflect that the wine wasn't stored correctly. And then serving, uh, before serving the wine, after presenting the cork, there would be the pouring of a small portion so that the, the purchaser can smell it, can taste it, can confirm it's good before it's served to everyone else around the table. Now that is with a high-end wine, um, but that should not be, uh, that should be done with all wines to some extent. If it's a, if it's a wine that's on your menu, uh, those steps may be not so, so ritualized as they are in a fine dining restaurant, but all of those service points should be met. Now then, it's important to talk about the Stelvin capsules. <clears throat> These are generally known as screw caps, in the, um, but Stelvin capsules are more and more um, frequently used and not just for low-end wines. So uh, there's a couple of misconceptions here that I want to talk about, and this is also on your quiz, so you'll need to remember this. A Stelvin capsule or a screw cap doesn't mean that the wine is cheap. Many high-end wines use Stelvin capsules more and more these days. This is a trend in the beverage industry. A Stelvin capsule does not mean that the server should not present the wine. So just because it's a screw cap doesn't mean that the server shouldn't go through all of those same steps. Uh, certainly you wouldn't present the cap to the server in the same way that you would present the, the cork, um, but it is important to hit all the other service points. And then a Stelvin capsule uh, doesn't stop the wine from spoiling. It can slow down the spoiling process somewhat, um, but it also doesn't stop the aging of the wine in the bottle. So uh, the wine ages not because it's in contact with cork or, or anything like that, but 
Uh, so it still ages in a Stelvin capsule uh, bottle, but those are some of the, the misconceptions around wine service. So I'm going to then move into beer. Beer is similar to wine more and more. Um, there are very high-end beers. There's uh, premium beers. There are import beers. Some beers, uh, which is a wheat beer, are served with a citrus wedge, depending on the traditions of that uh, beer beer maker. Um, there are very hearty beers that are dark and rich and have caramel and chocolate flavors. And these are natural components of the beer itself, not additives. Um, and, and some beers are served in steins, cold. Some beers are served closer to room temperature in a large open mouth goblet style glass. So there's as much ritual in beer uh, service as there is in wine. And there's certainly a lot to learn about beer service as well beer and ciders. And then in the beverage operations, uh, certainly a lot of profit is made by soda sales, coffee sales, and water sales. Um, we sell a lot of uh, bottled soda, uh, but also tap soda, coffee. Uh, we all know Starbucks, the coffee stands, uh, their primary, in many cases, their primary sources of revenue are coffee um, and the service of coffee, the various um, equipment that is needed to to be able to serve coffee correctly. Uh, and then water. Water, we have bottled water, but we also have various levels of, of water that, that uh, you need to be aware of. You have sparkling, you have mineral water, you have different types of water from around the world, some of which are very expensive. Um, so these are just some of the beverage uh, offerings that, that you need to be aware of. Now, when we move into alcohol service, we need to talk about safe serving of alcohol. Um, there are what are called dram shop laws, and this is uh, something that you need to be thinking about, not only for the quiz, but certainly for your operations. Um, as you move into managing uh, an operation that includes a beverage, beverage service, it's critical that you have uh, an understanding and that your team that your beverage service team has an understanding of what a dram shop law means. So if you can just follow along for a moment, imagine that you have someone walks into your bar and sits down and, and your bartender serves them six scotches, one right after the other in a row in a very short period of time. And there's no food consumed by that person at that point. They've done it in a short period of time they're likely to be intoxicated. Um, you know, it is at that point a liability. If that person gets up and walks out of your restaurant and goes, gets into their car and has an accident, God forbid, that accident, um, the liability for that accident comes back to the bartender who served the alcohol. That's what the dram shop law is. It means that the liability falls back to the person who served the alcohol. And in some, case, in some cases, that liability may go back to the owner of the establishment itself. So just as we talked about with food safety, alcohol safe uh, serving is critical for you as a manager to keep in mind because certainly that could close down your operation very quickly if you had an accident like that. There are various uh, certification processes that are in place. And uh, tips is one, serve safe. There are very, uh, there's a couple of them that are out there. They're all high quality uh, certification processes. And if you have this, if you have your staff certified, it might not be, it depends on the location, but it might not be required that you have your, your staff certified. But if you do have them certified and there is an accident, there's less of a likelihood that you as an operator or you as a bartender who served that person are going to be held liable. So there is tangible benefits to server certification. Beverage sales and analysis. Just as in the food service, um, we have the cost percentages uh, that we need to be aware of and understand, and the text has a great exercise for you to do. And then turnover. So when you have a stock of wine in the uh, in your cellar at your restaurant 
that's a large investment that you have tied up uh, your cash that you have now tied up in your inventory. And that is not money that you can do anything with except sell. And so you want to have high turnover. You don't want to be sitting on bottles of very high-end, expensive wine for years and months, months and years, because um, it's that turnover, obviously, that you need to have taking place, not only to generate the, the cash flow that you need to, to be able to maintain your operation, but also uh, the longer it sits in your shelf, the more likely it is to, to spoil. So turnover of your, uh, your uh, inventories is an important beverage sale analysis. And then trends in beverage, we've talked about several of those already. Um, certainly the, um, the, the focus on more boutique style or um, you know, the, the, the local sourced beers and local wines, um, some of the locally sourced alcohol, um, you know, there's, that's a big trend right now is uh, more trends towards the local. Uh, there's also certainly trends towards um, adding uh, different things into alcohol. So you have your energy drinks mixed with vodka and uh, things like that, Red Bull and vodka, things like that are trends in beverage uh, that you should be aware of. Um, and as uh, you know, as much as alcohol is not always healthy, it, uh, if it's drink, if it's not uh, consumed in moderation, of course, but uh, there is still a focus on a more healthy focus on beverages. So uh, away from some of the 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 sugar sweet uh, beverages and towards more healthful be beverages. So this concludes week four's lecture. Um, again, the material here you'll need to use for your posting of your uh, conversations in the lecture board, um, but also I wanted to encourage you to reach out to me if you do have any questions. So thank you all very much. I hope you all have a great week, and let me know if you have questions. Thank you.